In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we thank you for the Bible studies. Thank you for your people, faithful people who are here tonight. And in all the locations where we're connected, we're asking, O oh Lord, teach your people tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that the teaching will not be lost on any of us in Jesus' name. Bless your people, everyone without exception, in the study of tonight. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. We're coming to Mark chapter 4. And tonight we're learning from verse 10 all through to verse 20. The Lord Jesus Christ had taught in parables. In particular, the parable of the sower of the seed. And now he's going to give us the interpretation, the application, the exposition of the parable. Tonight, the message is Christ's exposition of the parable of the sower. Christ's exposition of the parable of the sower. Look at verse 10. In verse 10 it says, And when he was alone, they that were with him were the twelve asked of him the parable. He had given the parable, he had taught the multitude, then the twelve disciples, and the other people that were still with the twelve disciples, they came to him and they asked him, What's the import of the parable? What's the exposition of the parable? And what's the intention of the Lord on the parable? That's a good attitude. After hearing the word of God, that we come to the Lord and we get on our knees and we open our Bibles and we're finding out, how does this apply to me? What promise do I have in this? What precept do I have in this? What commandment, what injunction do I have in this? Actually, the twelve were in the habit of asking the Lord whenever he touched the public and he didn't fully understand. Look at verse 34. Mark chapter 4, verse 34. But without a parable, speaking not unto them, and when they were alone, those twelve, those disciples, when they were alone with him, he expounded all things to his disciples. Good habit to cultivate and good attitude to have. Look at Mark chapter 7, and I'm reading from verse 17. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 17. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. He had given them another parable. He had taught with another parable. And now they were asking him about the parable. Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 36. Matthew chapter 13. Verse 36, it tells us, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. Good attitude, good disposition for a learner, for a disciple, for a follower, for a believer, for a Christian to follow that when the word of God had been spoken and the word of God had been taught, we should be in the habit of asking whatever we don't understand so we can understand. We're coming back to Mark chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 13. Mark chapter 4, verse 13. And he said unto them... Know ye not this parable? How then will ye know all parables? He asked them, You don't understand this? If you don't understand this, how will you understand all the parables to you? Mark chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 18. Mark chapter 7, verse 18. And he said unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Remember, it's the teacher. 
Remember, it's the Messiah. Remember, it's the Christ. And remember, as students, you could challenge them as their Lord and Master. Don't you understand this? And they were not offended. And next time, when they did to understand, they still asked the question. He said in verse 18, Are you so without understanding? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever sin from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Understanding is very important. And when you hear the word of God, your intention and your attitude and your desire and your purpose should be that you understand. And Christ is always at hand. And the Holy Ghost is always available to lead us into all truth and to make us understand. Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 45. Luke 24, verse 45. Then open he their understanding. It's not just to hear what they hear, but the Lord Jesus Christ is interested in uh, the fact that we understand and for his own disciples and for us today as we depend on him as we trust him he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and he didn't even stop in the lifetime of the lord jesus christ you remember acts chapter 8 reading from the statue the eunuch of Ethiopia was reading uh, one of the passages in the prophet Isaiah. And he needed to understand. And the Spirit of God directed Philip to go there. Look at the question he asked him. Acts chapter 8, verse 30. And Philip ran thither unto him and had him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Understandest thou what thou readest? Understanding is very important. There are many people that have the practice of reading the Bible. Very good, very nice, and that's profitable. But they do not read to understand. They do not read to apply. They do not read to find out what's the Lord telling me today? And what's the Lord revealing to me today? What can I learn from this? How can I make spiritual progress? as to what i'm reading by what i'm reading today understandest thou what thou readest verse 31 and he said how can i accept some man should guide me how can i accept a teacher should guide me how can i accept an interpreter should guide me how can i accept an expositor of the bible to expose and to expound except he should guide me and he desired philip that he would come up and sit with him we're coming back to mark chapter 4. mark chapter 4 i read from verse 34. mark chapter 4 reading from verse 34. it tells us in verse 34 but without a parable, speaking not unto them. And when they were alone, in a conducive atmosphere to learn, when they were alone, with no disturbance, when they were alone, with no unbeliever around, when they were alone, with nobody to contradict what they were learning, when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. He expounded all things to his disciples. That's what he still does today. He wants his disciples of today, the saints of today, the believers of today. He wants us to understand. And so he gives us exposition of the word. He expounds, not some things, not the major part, all things unto them. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 27. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 27, and beginning at Moses, this is Christ, before his own disciples, and beginning at Moses, this is the risen Lord that continued what he was doing before he was crucified, before he was buried, and before he rose again. Now he's risen, 
and the disciples didn't understand the resurrection in line, the death, the burial, the resurrection in line with the scriptures. Look at this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Exposition of the word of God did not stop after Jesus went to heaven. As you come to Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, I'm reading from verse 23. Acts chapter 28, verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging. Many, and he used his lodging, the house where he was, at the temple, at the sanctuary, at the building, where he would expand the word to them, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God. That's what Paul did. To whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them in that exposition concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, and from morning till evening. From morning till evening. Can you say that with me? Say it aloud. From morning till evening. They were not tired, and he was not tired. You'll not be tired of the teaching of the word of God in Jesus' name. Christ's exposition of the parable of the sower. We're coming now to the body of the interpretation and the application of the parable to those disciples and to every hearer of the word of God and to ourselves today. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the ignorance and the faithlessness of hardened hearers. As he expanded the parables unto them, he picked those parables, the details of the parables one by one. And the first thing he tells us is about the one by the wayside. And it shows us the ignorance and the faithlessness of hardened hearers. They heard, they didn't believe, they heard, they were not converted, they heard, they were not saved. Their ignorance as well as their faithlessness because their hearts were hardened. Point number two, the incapacity and the fruitlessness of heedless hearers. The people that heard and it appeared they soaked it in, they got it in, it appeared they believed for a while. But then they didn't take heed when temptation came. When persecution came and when conflict trials came because of the word and because they were heedless, they didn't take heed. That's why they didn't have the capacity and the ability and the spirituality and the character and the comportment and the commitment to bear fruit, the incapacity and fruitlessness of heedless hearers. Point number three. The increase in fruitfulness, those over fruit, 30 fold and 60 fold and 100 fold, the increase in fruitfulness by honest hearts. Honest hearts. In fact, that's what Luke calls them. Look at Luke chapter 8, the last uh, people, set of people that had the word and they brought fruit unto perfection. Look at this in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. But that on the good ground are they which in an honest and good heart. That's how they bore fruit. That's why they bore fruit. It says, An honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. The increase in fruitfulness by honest hearts. We're coming back to Mark chapter 4 and I read here from verse 10. Mark chapter 4 reading from verse 10. 
And when he was alone, they, they that were about him with the toil asked of him the parable. And he said unto them, Unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. It says unto you, unto you my disciples, unto you those who are born again, unto you names are written in heaven, unto you who have been brought inside and you have been chosen. It is not a mystery unto you. The mystery shall be clear to you. But those who are outside the kingdom, outside the assembly of followers, outside the sanctuary of believers, outside the realm of grace, it is done to them. It is given to them in parables. Verse 12, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear. And not understand, lest at any time they should be converted and their sins should be forgiven them. He said, Those who are outside, they are hazy about the hearing, they do not understand, and it doesn't fit into their tradition. And because it doesn't fit into their tradition, into what they had known before, it's like a mystery unto them. And they, they hear, they don't perceive. They don't understand, they see, and they don't, uh, they don't really see very well and understand. It says they are not converted and their sins are not forgiven. Then it says, and he said unto them, Know ye not this parable? And how then will ye know all the parables? Let's look at Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. For us to understand these groups of people that hear the word and they don't perceive and they don't understand and they can't make application to themselves and they hear and they see and yet they do not understand what does all this mean. Why that? Let's look at Matthew chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 13. It says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seen, see not. They seen, see not. And hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. Underline that word, understand. This is how we get the best and the profit from the word when we understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. Why? Did God deny them that understanding heart? Will seize the will of God that they will come in vain to the study and hear the words in vain. Look at verse 15. For these people's heart is waxed gross, and their, uh, and their ears are dull of hearing. Their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Who closed their eyes? I said you close their eyes, they themselves, their eyes, they have closed. It's like they don't want to see anything different from their tradition. They don't want to see anything different from their old religion. They don't want to see anything different from all that they have been thinking of before and what they had had before. If anything is coming different from what they had had before, they close their eyes and they close their ears, lest at any time they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I shall heal them. They said, no, we don't want conversion. We don't want any change. We want to remain the way we have been. Come to Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. I'm, I'm reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 28, verse 25. 
and when they had agreed, when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that Paul had spoken one word, well speak the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto these people and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. As we see this over and over, from Isaiah to Matthew to Mark to the Acts of the Apostles, we need to preach of the Lord that our eyes will see what will perceive. Our ears will hear what will understand. And the good and the profit the word is to do in our lives, it will do without any restriction or limitation in Jesus' name. For the heart, in verse 27, for the heart of these people is what's gross, and their ears are done of hearing, and their eyes are day closed. Their eyes are day closed. Their eyes, they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. That's the purpose of hearing the word to be converted, to be changed, to be transformed, to have a new life and to have a name in the book of life for a change of life. A change of mind, a change of character, a change of disposition, a change of attitude, so that whosoever is in Christ will be a new creature, all things passing away, and all things becoming new. We're coming back to Mark chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 15. It's not going into the parable itself. And he wants to show us the first set of people that hear the word. And then, because they do not understand, something happens. Look at Mark chapter 4, verse 15. These are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. The word, perfect word, the pure word, the everlasting word, the word that is able to save the word that is able to heal, the word that is able to deliver, the word that is able to sanctify, the word that is able to regenerate, and the word that is able to transform any heart, every heart. It says, the word is sown, but when they have heard, when they have heard, tell me what you see in your Bible. Tell me what you see in your Bible. Satan comes when immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. And because of that, it did not bear fruit. It's surprising. And it's beyond human comprehension that anyone could hear the message of salvation, the message of redemption, the message of forgiveness and the message of how to get to heaven directly from the Savior himself and yet not get saved. It's surprising beyond human comprehension that the best of teachers that ever lived, the most loving of teachers that ever lived, the one that is the word personified, could come and declare the word unto these people. And he heard everything he said. There wasn't any vocabulary that they didn't understand. There wasn't any big word they couldn't, they couldn't understand. And yet, for the loving Christ, for the Savior himself, for the Master, a person that even some of them testified, no man ever spake like this man, and yet they were not saved. Why? They did not attempt to understand or apply the word. They heard it came in through one ear, passed out in the other ear. Because they didn't make any attempt to understand. Not only that, they were inattentive. They were ignorant. 
and they were disinterested. They, they, they just came just to hear. They just came habitually. They are becoming. That's their habit. They'll come anywhere they carry Bible, I go. Anywhere crusade is, I go. Anywhere they're missioning God, I go. Anywhere they're, you know, doing Bible study. I remember when I was in the primary school and we belonged to a Bible club. And now I hear they're doing Bible study somewhere and going there. But I'm still ignorant. And it was still disinterested. They were inattentive. Not only that, they rested in being the children of Abraham. They said, we've got it all. We're the children of Abraham. And since we're the children of Abraham, whatever he teaches and whatever he says, we know that other people may need conversion. Other people may need repentance. Other people may need regeneration, a new, new life. But we are the children of Abraham. Are there people like that here today? They have to say, my father is a Christian and my mother is born again. And since my parents are born again, and I just like the teaching of the Bible. And they come, and they come, and they come, and they don't understand a judge of what they are hearing. They understand the language. They understand the doctrine. They understand the songs. They understand everything we're seeing. But there's no personal application of the word unto themselves. They do not wake up to say, I realize I am a sinner. I realize I cannot save myself. I realize I'm not a match to Satan the devil. I realize only Jesus can save me. And I realize I must do something. I must give my life to Christ if I'm going to be born again. And they can spend 10 years coming to the church. They can spend 15 years coming to the church. And they can spend all their formative years coming to the church. And yet they rest in the fact that my parents are Christians. Not only that these people, they repented not and they believed not. Any conviction of the Spirit of God that will come to them, they shake it off. Anything that will make them feel you're not ready for heaven. You're not qualified for heaven. If you die now, you will perish forever and ever. They said, no, don't disturb me. And they shake that off their mind. These people, they heard Satan took away the word and then they didn't repent. Not only that, they hardened their hearts. They stiffened their necks. They stilled and seared their conscience. They didn't come to the study to have a change of life, to have transformation. They didn't come to study so that they can be convicted. They didn't come to study so that after conviction, they will get on their knees and they will confess their sins and they'll be converted. No, if there's going to be any conviction, they harden their hearts. They stiffen their necks. They say, no, don't feel sorry. No, don't feel guilty. You're right the way you are. These people... They were willing, they, they willingly opened their hearts and their spirits and their souls to Satan. When Satan knocked at the door, that thing you just had now, don't think about it. Let me take it away. That thing you just had now about heaven, about hell, don't think about that. Let me take that away. That thing you just had now that only Jesus can save. No, no, don't believe that. Don't accept that. And they open their hearts to Satan. And Satan comments immediately. And he took all those things away. They open their hearts to seducers. And they open their hearts to the people that will make them deny and make them destroy and make them not disbelieve the word of God. So they were not converted. They were lost. And they were not converted all through the mercy of Christ. They carelessly chose perdition and they missed paradise. And look at what the word is saying about them. Luke chapter 8. In Luke chapter 8, I read from verse 12. Luke chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, these people that had the word... And he didn't understand. And he didn't make any effort to understand. It says, those by the wayside are they that hear, 
then comes the devil, then comes the devil, always meets them after the Bible study to take what they have learned away. By the time they get back home, if you ask them, what did they say? What did you learn? What passage did they study? And what did you hear? How is it applicable to your life? They said, you know, I forgot you. And within one hour, everything is gone. It will not happen to you like that. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Let me show you something. If the word of God is in Genesis chapter 19, Genesis chapter 19. I'm reading here from verse 14. Genesis chapter 19. We're reading from verse 14. In verse 14, and Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters, and said, Ah, oh, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. There wasn't any kind of misunderstanding, misinterpretation, misrepresentation of what he said. The Lord will destroy the city. He got the message directly from angels, two angels that came to him. And it wasn't any secret at all. The previous night, all those Sodomites had been knocking at the door. They wanted to commit sodomy with those angels. They were blindfolded. It was uh, public news. Everybody knew what was happening. And he came to them. The Lord will destroy this city. But she seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law seem like one mocking that can't be true beautiful place like this large place like this how can that happen when the morning arose then the angels hasting lord and seeing arise take thy wife and thy daughters which are here lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city and while he lingered the man laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord be merciful unto him. And they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now look at verse 24. In verse 24, it says, And the Lord, then the Lord reigned upon Sodom and Gomorrah, Brimstone and fire, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Verse 26. Verse 26. Are you there? I said, Are you there? One, two, three, go. Read it aloud. His wife looked back. She saw the angels. Those two angels spent the whole night in their house. And she heard when the angels told the Lord, go and tell those who have married your daughters. And tell them, the Lord is going to destroy this place. She wasn't paying attention. She didn't hear, although she heard. She didn't see, although she saw. Her mind was not there. Business as usual and activity as usual and then the angels laid hold on her hand and on the hand of the husband lord and on the hand of the daughters she felt the touch of the hands of the angels and the angels said escape to the mountain don't stay in the valley she heard she didn't understand and she saw she didn't perceive and were told but his wife looked back from behind him and became, tell me, a pillar of salt. It will not happen to you. It will not happen to any of us. We must take heed to what we're hearing. And let's look at Osea chapter 8. Osea chapter 8. 
this is a problem for the people that heard they need to understand they heard they didn't lay it in their hearts in Hosea chapter 8 verse 12 I have written to him the great things of my Lord but they were counted as a strange thing I've revealed unto him I've given him the revelation I've taught him I've taught them the great things of my Lord but they just tossed this aside and they counted it as a strange thing. I come to New Testament. I'm looking at Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, and I'm reading from verse seven. In Second Timothy chapter three, reading from verse seven, here is what it says about such people. I'm waiting for you to open your Bible. Second Timothy, what chapter are we looking at? I said, what chapter are we looking at? And what verse? Chapter 3, verse 7. Ever learning, ever hearing, ever reading, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning about salvation, and never able to come to the experience of salvation ever learning about God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life ever hearing of the love of God and ever tapping into connecting with the love of God ever hearing that there's no other name by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus that Jesus is the only savior there is no name under heaven there's no name in any nation that that can get anyone saved but the name of Jesus ever learning and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the Savior the knowledge of the truth ever learning follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord ever hearing that ever learning that and never able to come to the experience of peace with God and peace with man and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord ever learning ever hearing that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin for the seed of God remains in him and he cannot sin he will not sin because the seed abides in him he is ever hearing that and yet is never able to overcome the smallest and the least of all temptations ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth it will not happen to me I say it will not happen to me. You come to the knowledge of salvation, the knowledge of sanctification, and the knowledge of power to live above sin in your life every day in Jesus' name. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed, make an effort. We ought to give the more honest seed. You must endeavor to do that. We need to give, we ought to give the more honest seed to the things which we have heard. Lest at any time eh, we should sleep, we should let them sleep. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received, it just recompense of reward. How shall we escape? How shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? You will not remain ignorant. The word of God will bear fruit in your life in Jesus' name. It will bear the fruit of repentance. It will bear the fruit of regeneration. It will bear the fruit of righteousness in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Mark chapter 4 now. Point number 2. The incapacity and fruitlessness of heedless hearers. Heedless hearers. I'm reading from Mark chapter 4 and I come to verse 16. Mark chapter 4 verse 16. And these are they likewise 
which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure, but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. They are not ready to bear persecution. They are not ready to resist temptation. And they are not ready for any trial at all. And they don't have any form of self-denial, any little challenge, any little difficulty that arises because of the word they give up. They say, I didn't know it would be like that. You will not give up. You will not give up. I will not give up. I will not give up. You will not give up in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. How is it? And why do people hear the word and they seem to accept the word? They seem to rejoice in the word and they seem to be glad when they hear that word and they seem to say, Yes, I believe. That's the truth. I saw it in all those verses and I know that this is the word of God. How is it that they are happy? For a moment and they are glad for a moment and then later we hear that they've come back we hear that they are backsliding we hear they are not remaining abiding in the world look at the reasons jesus gave why they were incapable why they were fruitless because they were heedless number one they received with gladness for a time but later abandoned the faith. They received what gladness for a time, and later abandoned the faith. Look at Mark chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 20. Mark chapter 6, verse 20. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him. And when he, Herod, heard him, John, he did many things and had him gladly. Can you think about that? Did you ever know that there was a time when Herod actually appreciated John because he had the word of God from him? He actually even did some things. He did many things and he had him gladly. But something happened now. We're coming to verse, uh, coming to verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herod's sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John, thinking, he will listen to me. He will hear me. He always hears me gladly. He always rejoices whenever I speak to him. It's not many things before. As I spoke to him, I need to tell him this. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. That stopped his interest. That quenched his interest. And that removed all the gladness that he had before. There are people, they will listen up to a point. There are people, they rejoice in the hearing of the word up to a point. But when you begin to talk about the word of God that goes against polygamy, that you keep your first wife and your first wife alone, then they part ways with you. When you begin to say that if we're looking for anything and then we go to idols and we go to all those occultic powers and we get anything, that thing will ruin you, will destroy you. Then they part ways. They said, I didn't know he will teach doctrine. I didn't know he will go as far as saying that. 
they hear gladly but then they abandoned what they have had number two no thorough conversion and no total cleansing from their covetousness that's what happens that's what happens when somebody hears the word of god and he appears to say i accept i believe that i sign to that i give my life count on me i'm ready for water baptism check up are they cleansed from their covetousness we're looking at acts chapter 8 acts chapter 8 i read from verse 13 acts chapter 8 verse 13 then simon himself believed also simon he believed also and when he was baptized he continued with philip and wondered beholding the miracles and the signs which were done but now something happened peter and john came from jerusalem and they laid hands on the self sanctified people and they received the holy ghost and then the thing that was still inside simon came out you would have thought he had totally believed he forsook all his uh, magic and everything and was following after Philip. But now what he saw made us to see what was still inside him. Verse 18. And when Simon saw the throat laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money. He wanted to corrupt the ministers of God. The corruption had not left him. He still had this corruption inside him. Although he was baptized by Philip, although he was following Philip all about, corruption was still there. He offered them money saying, Give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Then Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. Peter was incorruptible. I am incorruptible. You are not. I am incorruptible. Money will not take your condition away from you. Money will not take heaven from your hand. And money will not take your name out of the book of life in Jesus' name. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Look at that. Although you are baptized in water, although you have been following Philip, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God, he peradventure, he perhaps the thoughts of thine heart may be forgiven thee, for I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. That's why some of the people, I believe, I believe, I rejoice, and I'm glad that they are saying this unto us. It comes to a point where that what touches the covetousness in their heart, and then they come out in their true colors. And you know it's like that, if it's like that, and we can't make money out of this, if it's like that, we can't raise up a business out of this, then I'm going back. I don't think I can continue. They were not really in before. Number three, they had no root in personal conviction. No root in personal conviction. That's what Jesus said. He said, because they had no root, it's not deep inside them that the thing will take root and the thing will grow personal conviction personal conviction the root was not there that's why they fell away i will not fall away second chronicles second chronicles chapter 24 second chronicles chapter 24 we're looking at verse 2 second chronicles chapter 24 and we're reading from verse 2 these people who say yes i believe Yes, I believe as long as we are together. Yes, I believe as long as that a child, that 
daughter, that son is uh, here with us and with the peers. I believe, I believe. And then let them go to university and let them go to college. They have no root in themselves. And the little winds that blow there will blow the superficial salvation, blow everything away because there is no root. Look at Second Corinthians, Second Chronicles chapter 24, verse 2. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord in the days of Jehoiada the priest. As long as Jehoiada was available around, the fellow did good, everything was all right, I believe. I accept, I rejoice, I like it. This is my church, I am deeper and I'm going to follow until the very end, as long as we're together. But look at verse 15 now. In verse 15, it says, But Jehoiada waxed old and was full of days when he died, and 130 years old was he when he died. Now, what's Joash going to do now? Because the one that had been looking over his shoulder, that made him to say, I believe, I accept, I'm going on, I will continue, I will never look back, that one is dead now. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada came, the princes of Judah and made obeisance to the king and the king Joash hearkened unto them and they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols and the wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem for this their trespass. I'm asking you today, where is your son? I'm asking you today, where is your daughter? The son, when she was with you, when he was with you, will come to church and run to church. Your child, your daughter, when she was still under your roof, will run to the church and say, Daddy, Mommy, I'm going to lead us fellowship. Daddy, Mommy, I'm going to sing in the choir. Daddy, Mommy, I'm going to do this. But now, they went just a few months ago now, and they went to college far away, or they traveled to America, or traveled to Canada, or traveled to Europe, and the church is nearby. Deeper Life Bible Church is there. Where is he? Where is she? Is he still going to church? Is still still having the root and the conviction that she had, that he had when he was here? That's the problem. That's the problem. When people say, I believe, I believe, they don't have any roots in them. And then we're here, they are gone. Your child will not go. If they have gone, you'll do everything you can do and bring them back to the Lord in Jesus' name. I just wonder for parents who are spending thousands, millions of naira. And they're spending uh, thousands of dollars and pounds of euros. And they, they will wreck everything. They will go hungry. They will do whatever they can do. And send the school fees out to them over there. But they will not make the same effort in telling their children, education will not take you to heaven. All this college degree will not take you to heaven. We're wrecking everything we've got and we're going hungry to make sure you have education. But I want you to have salvation too. Want you to have holiness too. Want you to make heaven too. If they don't have roots in themselves, you will make sure they have roots in themselves. That they will know that they have conviction and they can stand and they will stand in Jesus' name. I want to talk to you parents uh, who are laboring night and day and you're helping other children and you're helping other youths and you're helping adults and you're helping families in the church. You're helping them to stand, you counsel, you teach, you preach, you do everything. But how about your child? 
Are, are they going to spend heaven at the eternity with you in heaven? Or are they going to the other side? Have you ever thought about that? What will happen if they don't make heaven? Now, number four, these people, the reason they could not stand is that they could not endure persecution. They could not endure name calling. They could not endure any trial because of the word. Galatians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they, com they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Only lest they should suffer persecution. Persecution, no. They're too delicate. And as delicate as they are, if anybody confronts them, okay, you say you're a Christian, you're born again, you're deeper, and you're sanctified, and you're thinking about heaven, eh, leave all the things of the world for us. Why well, are you struggling for the things of the world? After all, you're deeper, and after all, you're going to heaven. They can't stand that. They can't stand that. If they gossip about them, they can't stand that. If they kind of insult them, assault them, they cannot stand that. If you cannot stand that, you are one of those people that heard the word and you received gladly. But then when persecution came, you fell away. You will not fall away. Number five, encumbrance for the cares of this world. The cares of this world. And Jesus said the people that receive the word amongst us, that the people that the cares of this world came and choked the word. It tells us in, in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time, any time your hearts be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares there are people they say they are christians yes they still come to church they say they are christians yes they're even among workers they say they are christians yeah, they, they might be among the ministers but the cares of this life the cares of this life. This one, I grab it. This one, I must have that. My neighbors, they have this kind of uh, motor vehicle. I must have that too. My neighbors, they are building land in a popular area, expensive area. I must have that too. And my neighbors are traveling here and there. I too, even though I'm a Christian, I must have that too. Who are you competing with? They don't have a heaven to gain and they don't have a hell to shun and they're going on their way in the broad path that leads to destruction and you're competing with them take heed to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with sufficient and drunkenness and the cares of this life so that they come upon you unawares verse 35 for as a snare shall each come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You will stand. Number six, other people are blindfolded by the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches. They're going along and going along and they come to the Bible study, and they come to Sunday worship, and they're also workers, and they're diligent, they're committed, until they got a work. They got a job. They couldn't get the job over here. They couldn't get the job in the country here. They got the job somewhere where there's no church. They got the job somewhere where the believers are not free to meet together. And they say, really, I don't think I should take this, but they're waiting for a job for a long time. Well, I will stand. I will stand. And then they go. They go alone by themselves. No wife, the children, wife, they're here. And they get to that place. 
They say, I will connect. The messages are online. I will connect. For the first two, three weeks, they try to connect. But then the demand of the new job they have taken pins them down. Little by little, they miss everything. They are backsliding. They are totally gone. Thinking about heaven, that's not in their mind again. And thinking about how to get there to those party gates, that's not in their minds again. All the things they promised themselves, they cannot fulfill anymore. Even to contact the wife back here in Nigeria, all that they cannot do now. They are just there. Another woman is getting interested in them. They are getting interested in another woman and they don't see anything wrong. And they abandon the one here, abandon the children here because they are in pursuit of the deceitfulness of riches. The Lord save us from that in Jesus' name. I need to get amen from a good church. Because you see, these are the things that are taking people away from the faith. All these winds blowing will not take you away. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Money, money, money. I want it. I must get it. He that loveth money shall not be satisfied with money. He that loveth abundance shall not be satisfied with increase. This also is vanity. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, it says, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. All this money, you'll not carry a penny, a penny, a farthing away. As he came into this world empty, not having anything, so shall he go and shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. He may, he may uh, then it says in verse 16, and this also is a so evil that in all points, as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he that has labored for the wind? You'll not labor for the wind. I will not labor for the wind. Think about it, all that you amass, all that you get, all that you are running after, all that you are kind of throwing your life away for. If you died today, you will not take anything away. And the only thing you can take away is your salvation. The only thing you can take away is the confirmation of the conversion you have, the new life you have in Christ, the ticket to heaven, the holiness without no man shall see the Lord. And you're not caring about that enough. We're looking at 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I read from verse 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful laws, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith. They have erred from the faith. They are not keeping their convictions anymore. They are here, they are here, they are there. They are mixing with this and mixing with that. And they cannot openly stand like a Paul and like a Peter and say, whether it be right in the sight of God or your sight, to obey you rather than God judge you. But we must obey that which you have heard and seen. If you cannot stand like that and you are now compromising, you are not even sure of your salvation anymore. When you think deeply inside your heart, the love of money is the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And then Jesus said the people, who are not able to bear fruit and bring fruit to perfection. He says, the lost of other things entering in. The lost of other things entering in. Inordinate affection, disproportionate desire for other things entering in choke the world. That's what the Lord himself is telling us in Colossians chapter 3. 
Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Set your affection, set your love, set your desires, set your affection on things above and not things on the earth. Things above and not things on the earth. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Any man any minister, any child of God, he goes to the world, he's getting near and near and near, and he gets to uh, the brink of the world, and he says, I can still stand, I'm still standing, I still believe the Bible, I'm still deep in life, uh, look at this, love not the world, neither the six that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world. The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the loss thereof. But he that doeth the will of God, you see here tonight, he that doeth the will of God, I say, you see here tonight, the Lord confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He will abide forever. We're coming to point number three now. The increase in fruitfulness by honest hearts. We're coming to Mark. Mark chapter 4 verse 20. Mark chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 20. And these are they which are sown on good ground. Sown on good ground. Sown on good ground. Such as hear the word and receive it and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some an hundred. Luke chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 15. Luke chapter 8, reading from verse 15. But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart, you see that? It's a heart. Honest and good heart. Having heard the word, keep it in the heart, and bring forth fruit with patience is the heart you will bear fruit. John chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 2. John chapter 15, verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. You see that? Number one, fruit. Number two, more fruit. Verse four, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Do you see that? There's fruit, thirtyfold. There's more fruit, sixtyfold. There's much fruit, a hundredfold. For without me, ye can do nothing. But age herein is my Father glorified, that she bear much fruit so shall ye be my disciples verse 16 ye have not chosen me but i have chosen you and ordained you that ye should bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever 
ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He wants us to bear fruit, you'll bear fruit. Spiritual fruit. Christ-like fruit. Character, moral fruit. Positive, practical fruit. Influential fruit. That is, you'll bear fruit that will make you influential on the lives of other people, that those people, through you, they also will become born again, they'll be children of God, and they will bear fruit like you. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. Colossians chapter 1, verse 10. That ye might walk worthy of the Lord, unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful in every good work, increasing from 30 to 60 to 100, increasing in the knowledge of God. I want to remind you that what makes anyone to bear fruit is the condition of the heart. Number one, the heart that bears fruit. That heart is contrite. Look at Isaiah chapter 57. I'm reading from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15, for thus says, The high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place, with him that also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The people that hear the word and it's like their hearts are broken. It's like I see that about myself. I say that about myself. They are contrite in heart and they receive the word of God. It is that contrition of heart that begins in making them to bear fruit. These are people that have convicted hearts and converted hearts. Convicted hearts and converted hearts. They hear the word of God like we're hearing tonight. And they're convicted in their hearts. And eventually they come to the Lord. They confess before the Lord, I am the man, I'm the woman. I see that I have not been the way I ought to be. And the convictions I used to have, the roots I used to have, those roots are no more there. I'm the man, I'm the woman. They are convicted and they are converted. Look at Acts chapter 2, reading from verse 37. Now, when they had this, they were preached in their heart. They were convicted in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, forgiveness, cleansing of your sins. And ye shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Verse 40. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this unto a generation. Then they that gladly received his word, they were not offended by the confrontational message of Peter. They were not offended, annoyed by his pointing finger to them. You are the people that killed Christ. They gladly received this word. They were baptized. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. These people had the cleansed, they have cleansed and prepared hearts. Cleansed and prepared hearts. Those are the people that bear fruit. All the things that will have choked the word is cleansed away from their heart. They have cleansed and prepared hearts. We're looking at Psalm 51. I'm reading from verse 10. Psalm 51. Reading from verse 10. Here it tells us about the kind of heart we have if we're going to bear fruit. Create in me a clean heart, O God. 
and renew a right spirit within me, creating me a clean heart. Oh God, it's a new creation. It's something here you know, that is going to come just now. As we pray, if we hear the word of God and we don't pray, it will not come. Creating me a clean heart and renewing me a right spirit. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Job chapter 11. In Job chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 13. Job 11, reading from verse 13. If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thy hands toward him, that's how to bear fruit. After hearing the word of God, if you prepare your heart and you stretch out your hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away. And let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacle. There are the people that have humble and tender hearts. Humble and tender hearts. If our hearts are tender, when we hear the word of God, then we go to work on what we have heard. I must correct that. I must readjust that. I must remove that. I must put that in place so that I can bear fruit, humble and tender heart. Second Chronicles chapter 34. In Second Chronicles chapter 34, I read from verse 27. Second Chronicles chapter 34. We're reading from verse 27. Because thine heart was tender and thou didst humble thyself before God when thou hadest his word against this place and against the inhabitants thereof and humbles and humbles thyself before me and did wrench thy clothes and weep before me I have heard thee also says the Lord the heart must be contrite. The heart must be convicted and converted. The heart must be cleansed and prepared. The heart must be humble and tender. The heart must be purified, sanctified, circumcised. The heart must be purified, sanctified, circumcised. Those are the hearts that bear fruit. Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm reading from verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we're reading from verse 6. It tells us in verse 6, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. That's if that heart is presented before the Lord in prayer. But if after hearing the word, we rush out anywhere, we rushing out to the toilet, Rushing out to take a bus, rushing out for something, we've heard the word, and that's all. The word will just go over your head, it will not be any fruit. But you stay, you wait in the presence of God, and He circumcises your heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Number six, obedient heart free from sin. Obedient heart, free from sin. There's no cherished sin you're hiding, you're keeping, you're holding on to. You have an obedient heart, you tremble at the word of God, and you help, you receive help from the Lord to be free from sin. It tells us in Romans chapter 6, Verse 17, but God be thanked that she was servants of sin were in the past, but she have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you and being then made free from sin, ye became 
the servants of righteousness. And then you have a believing, receptive heart. A believing, receptive heart. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading from verse 13. First Thessalonians chapter 2. Reading from verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it as the word, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe you receive the totality of the word. I said you receive the totality of the word. And this word will bear fruit in your life, in my life, in Jesus' name. It will bear fruit in your ministry. Bear fruit in my ministry. You will not be like the wayside ground that hears and then the devil takes everything away. You will not be like the stony ground where they receive gladly and then the sun scorches everything. You'll not be like the sunny ground. You'll be the good ground. And you will be like this that is sown on good ground. As you hear the word, you've heard the word. You receive the word, you have received the word. You will bring forth fruit. Thirtyfold. Amen. Thirtyfold. Sixtyfold. A hundredfold. The Lord will bless your life. You'll bear abundant fruit. Heaven will rejoice because of you. I too, I will rejoice because of you. You will rejoice because of me. We will bear fruit together. Amen. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Rise up now. Spend some time in the presence of God and say, God, I've heard your word. I'm going to bear fruit. You'll bear fruit. That's why you came. The Lord loves you. He doesn't want you to hear the word in vain. This word will bear fruit in your life, will bear fruit in your family, will bear fruit in your children, will bear fruit in your ministry, will bear fruit in everything we do and everything we touch.